We are live from Tyne Davis Gymnasium on the campus of Faulkner University. The debate on the existence of God. This is being live streamed to many people around the country. We're thankful for your interest in this debate. We have a packed house here in Tyne Davis Gymnasium. We have many young people from various academies and schools across the state and even outside of the state. Much interest for this debate. I'm David Hester, Associate Professor of New Testament at the VP Black College of Biblical Studies. And I'll be the moderator and the timekeeper for this debate. And I want to explain briefly, uh, first introducing the participants and then explain briefly the format and the guidelines for this debate. We have Kyle Butt who works for Apologetics Press and has been with them for 20 years and is the author of numerous books. And we also have Michael Shermer who is the editor of Skeptic Magazine, author of many books and host of the Michael Shermer Show, which is a podcast. If you would please give these two participants a round of applause. Now let me tell you the format of how this will take place. There will be 20 minutes for main propositions from Kyle Butt and then 20 minutes from Michael Shermer. Then there will be rebuttals of 10 minutes, Kyle Butt, and then 10 minutes, Michael Shermer. Then there will be an intermission. And then that we will have cross-examinations of 10 minutes, Kyle Butt, and then 10 minutes, Michael Shermer. And then we will open questions from the audience. That will be a total of 20 minutes. There will be alternating questions, two minutes to answer, and the other speaker one minute to respond. And we ask those who want to ask questions to come down to the central microphone when the time comes, not before, but when the time comes, and ask your question briefly. No speeches, please. And then at conclusion of the debate, We'll have 10-minute conclusion by Michael Shermer and a 10-minute conclusion from Kyle Butt, approximate total of two hours. As timekeeper, I will be strictly enforcing the time for both participants, and this is how it will go. I will announce five, that will be five minutes, two, two minutes, one, one minute. That means they need to wrap it up, so that's how that will go. Guidelines for the debate, I will not go over all the guidelines. They have been signed by both participants. As I've just mentioned concerning the, the time frame, those were agreed to beforehand. The debate proposition is the God of the Bible exists. Kyle Butt affirming the proposition, Michael Shermer denying. Neither disputant will introduce into his last speech arguments or evidence that has not previously been introduced into the debate unless such is obviously necessary to reply to what the other has stated. Now, one hint for the audience. As the moderator, I am the enforcer, which means we will not tolerate any, I repeat, any outbursts of any sort, which means no amens, no attaboys, no aw, nothing like that. If you do, one warning will be given, one. If you persist in that, I will direct some of our Zorn scholars and whoever else is an enforcer to escort you out of the building. If you don't believe me, try me. <laughs> so, with that all said, we are ready to begin the debate, the beginning speech delivered by Kyle Budd. Dr. Shermer, Dr. Hester, and Faulkner University appreciate your participation and what you've done to make this possible. Also appreciate all of you who have chosen to take your time, who have chosen to be here today, and the reason that I think it's so important that you are here is because it shows that you're thinking people, that you care enough about the most important questions in life to spend serious time dealing with him. I'd also like to tell you how glad I am to be in this debate with Dr. Michael Shermer. He is a very intelligent, 
very well-known, very widely listened to spokesperson for unbelief. And when he was on the Ben Shapiro show in 2018, Ben Shapiro said, hey, I think that you are one of the most well-known atheist in our country, maybe in the world. And after reading the material from Dr. Shermer, watching several of his videos, etc., I think that he absolutely does represent the side of unbelief extremely well. And so here we are to discuss the existence of God, uh, specifically the God of the Bible that is eternal, that is all-powerful, that is loving, all-knowing, the spiritual God. And so as we're here to discuss this God, what I want you to know is that I am not here to win a debate. You know, when the topic of debate comes up, somebody says, are you going to win? Is the other person going to win? We're not here to win. There is something we are here to do, though, I think. And that is to get to the truth and make it as plain and clear as possible and present it to this audience in a way that you can choose to believe it if you want to. And that's what we're trying to do, get at truth. So as we explore this question, I'd like to suggest that a scientific approach to this question will be our best to employ. Unfortunately, certain modern definitions of science say that, that that's not possible to have a scientific discussion of God. In fact, certain modern definitions say that you have to limit your scientific answers to something that you can touch, see, taste, hear, or smell that can be detected by your five senses. But science should not be so limited. In fact, I think that does it a grave injustice. Instead, I think we would do well to heed the words of Socrates, who is attributed with the words, we must follow the argument where it leads. And I think that all of us should have the courage to do that, follow the argument where it leads. On the opening pages of Dr. Shermer's book, The Moral Ark, he quotes J. Robert Oppenheimer. And Oppenheimer said this, There must be no barriers to the freedom of inquiry. There is no place for dogma in science. The scientist is free and must be free to ask any question, to doubt any assertion, to seek for any evidence, to correct any errors. And I think we can all agree that the bravest approach to life's most important questions is to follow the evidence where it leads. So, a scientific approach then requires that we adhere to truth and reason. Truth represents what we can know about reality. Reason represents proper, proper thinking about that truth. And so we find what we know, we reason properly about that, and we come to having what we're talking about as truth and reason. Let's begin then by looking at four foundational truths that I believe every person in this audience can understand. I don't believe these take a, a PhD. I don't believe they take extended periods of secondary education, etc., on into graduate school, etc. I think everybody can understand these. I'll tell you what I do think they take, though. I do believe that they take an open mind and a person who says, I'm going to follow the evidence where it leads. And so let's begin. Foundational truth number one. Every material effect has a cause. The universe exists and it's real. We have something here and not nothing. The natural question that every single person arrives at is how did the universe get here? Or what caused the universe? Now, we ask this question because we understand the scientific law of causation. This law is the driving force behind every experiment ever done in science. And it simply says that every material effect must have a cause that brought the effect into existence. As Robert Jastrow, the founding director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies said, quote, as Einstein said, scientists live by their faith in causation and the chain of cause and effect. Every effect has a cause and 
it can be discovered by rational arguments. And this has been a very successful program, if you will, for unraveling the history of the universe, but it just fails at the beginning. Now, kids are wonderful at getting down to the bottom of this. A child might say, as he picks up a rock, Mom, where did this rock come from? And the mother would say, well, it, it chipped off a rock from the hillside. And he would say, well, where did that rock come from? You see the cycle. What's the child ultimately asking? I want to know where the first rock came from. And that's what we're getting at here. And I think this is where the assumption that scientific answers must be materialistic betrays those who are trying to follow the argument where it leads. Because at some point in the past, there had to have been an entity not composed of matter and energy that could bring into existence the physical universe. Now, that's why Dr. Jastrow continued, and I quote, Astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began abruptly in an act of creation. That there are or what there, there are what I or anyone else would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Thus, proper reasoning about the truth of the law of causation would force us to the conclusion that the universe had a supernatural cause. Now, let me pause right here and say, I'm not quoting anybody to say you should believe this authority. In fact, as we look at this idea, the law of causation stands on its own, both philosophically, logically, scientifically. You don't need an authority to tell you what the law of causation is or to tell you what the law of causation implies. But I am quoting some people from the world of science to show that these ideas of causation and what they imply are recognized even by many leaders in the scientific community. And so that's foundational truth number one. Foundational truth number two, anything that exhibits complex functional design demands an intelligent designer. First, let's apply this to the universe. As it turns out, our universe is so perfectly designed that you can almost not even put it into words. People who study our universe have come up with something called the Goldilocks universe or the Goldilocks zone or the Goldilocks enigma. And that is that it looks like our universe is so perfectly fine-tuned that it was designed for humans to live on planet Earth. That's what it looks like as you look at the constants of the universe. And let me show you what I mean by that. Imagine you came into a control room and there were dials on a control panel and there were over 25 of them and each one of them had to be tuned to a very precise place in order for the universe to exist as it does and for life to exist. And when we're talking very precise, I mean, do, do we mean that it just needs to be a, a little bit close? Um, let me tell you the precision of these constants. If you were to take just one, the force of gravity, and you were to have a dial that said force of gravity, the precision of what that has to be tuned to is this. If you had a dial and you had one tenth, you had ten segments and you were on one segment of that tenth, that would be a one with one zero. If you took the dial and had a hundred places, two zeros, well, you would chop that little dial into 100 places, it'd be 100 marks, and you would get it exactly right on one. That'd be a one with two zeros. One with three zeros, a thousand places, you divide that dial into a thousand little segments, you get the right one. Okay, a billion would be nine zeros. So you would have a, a billion tiny little segments on the dial, and it would be precisely tuned to one of them. Oh, but the, the force of gravity is fine-tuned to a one with 50 zeros behind it. Like I said, that's fine-tuning almost that you can't even put into words, and that's just one dial on the panel. Many of the other ones are one with 37 zeros behind it, one with 40 zeros behind it, and they all have to be exactly right. And so as we look at that, many physicists recognize what this fine-tuning demands. A theoretical physicist Paul Davies said, the impression of design is overwhelming. Astronomer Fred Hoyle put it this way, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed 
with the physics. As atheistic physicist George Greenstein stated, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather capital agency, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof for the existence of a supreme being? Now, like I said, the atheistic physicist, George Greenstein, because I'm not saying these people agree with that conclusion. I'm not saying they say, okay, it looks designed so it is. In fact, let me tell you what George Greenstein said. He said, it's a matter of taste how one deals with this notion. Those who wish to are free to accept it. And I have no way to prove them wrong. But I know where I stand. I reject it utterly. So anyone can reject the conclusion that a supernatural agency brought the universe into existence if they want to. But I would argue that they can't logically or reasonably do so. And most people who reject the idea of a creator begin with a false assumption that truth must only arrive at or science must only come to conclusions that are materialistic or naturalistic, scientific naturalism. Now, not only does the universe exhibit this type of design, but as we look at the biological world around us, animals and other living things, we see that there is much design in the universe. Well, let's just take the human brain, the most complex three pounds of matter in the entire universe. The human brain takes up about 1,300 cubic centimeters. It's about the volume of 10 tennis balls. But what we find out is that it's got amazing computing capabilities. And to illustrate this, let's compare it to a supercomputer. There's a supercomputer called the Fugaku supercomputer that's in Kobe, Japan. This Fugaku supercomputer can process operations at one half of a quintillion operations per second. Massive number. It is housed in a place that takes up about 6,000 square feet, which is two tennis courts. It uses 400 million watts of electricity per hour. Fascinating supercomputer. Now let's compare our brain to that. Our brain, again, 1,300 cubic centimeters. Uh, it housed in something far, far less than 6,000 square feet. It takes 12 watts of energy to power per hour, and it can process one quintillion operations per second. That's twice as much as the Fugaku computer, and that human brain not only processes twice as much, but it's doing all kinds of other things while it's computing information. And so, if we just compare the human brain to a supercomputer, there's no doubt that we see complex functional information involved. The Fugaku, Fugaku supercomputer cost a billion dollars to build, and it was constructed over many years. So we see this in the material world. Now, in his book, Darwin Matters, Dr. Shermer said, the reason people think that a designer created the world is because it looks designed. Now again, Jerry Coyne, in his book, Why Evolution is True, said, nature, nature resembles a well-oiled machine. The more one learns about plants and animals, the more one marvels at how well their designs fit their ways of life. Of course, these men don't believe in God, but the fact remains, as Stephen Mayer stated, in all cases where we know the origins of specified information, intelligent design played a causal role. There's an excellent reason that the universe and life in the universe look designed. The argument goes as follows. Anything that exhibits complex functional design demands an intelligent designer. The universe and life in the universe exhibit complex functional design. Therefore, the universe and life in it had an intelligent designer. Foundational truth number three, objective moral values exist. Some thoughts and actions are absolutely right and some are absolutely objectively morally wrong. And now Dr. Shermer in his book, The Science of Good and Evil, when he discusses ethics and morality, he says that this, and I quote, is the single biggest obstacle to a complete acceptance of the theory of evolution. Five minutes. There is a good reason that that's the case. Let's consider the idea of an implication. An implication is something that is not stated, but you have to reason to that. 
Uh, the most famous is uh, Socrates is all men are mortal, Socrates is a man. Those are the two explicit statements. But now what's the implication? If you reason to what's not stated, therefore Socrates is mortal. And so as we look at this idea of objective moral values, what we see is that many people in the atheistic community have reasoned properly from atheism to the conclusion that there would be none. Let me show you what I mean. Renowned atheist Richard Dawkins said, this universe that we observe has precisely the properties we would expect if there is at bottom no purpose, no design, no good, no evil, nothing but pitiless indifference. Cornell University, William Provine said, and I quote, no inherent moral or ethical laws exist, nor are there any absolute guiding principles for human society. The universe cares nothing for us and we have no ultimate meaning. Here's what he's saying, if atheism is true and the material world is all that there is, there can be no objective moral standard outside of humanity and so they reason properly that without God in the picture you cannot put forward an objective moral standard. And as you look at that, even Charles Darwin recognized this truth. He says, and I quote, a man who has no belief in a personal God can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him to be the best. Or as Jean-Paul Sartre honestly and forthrightly stated, everything indeed is permitted if God does not exist. If there is no personal and moral God, there can be no objective morals. In order for objective moral values to exist, God must exist. Objective moral values do exist, therefore, God exists. Also, I want you to understand what's not being said here. What's not being said is, okay, everybody who believes in God always acts morally. Everybody who doesn't believe in God acts immorally. And that shows that there is not objective. That's not what's being said. This has nothing to do with the way people act. It has to do with the implication that the material world is, all, world is all there is. If the material world is all that exists, then people like William Provine and Charles Darwin and Richard Dawkins, they come to the conclusion, properly thinking about the, the wrong statement that this world is all that exists, Two, there can't be objective moral values. And so we're not saying that the way people behave says if there are or are not objective moral values. You understand what I'm trying to nail down on that. And now the final truth that I'd like to present. The life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dr. Shermer doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he certainly doesn't believe that he rose from the dead. And there might be many of you in this audience or listening or watching live stream that don't believe that either. Two what we find, though, is that as we look at the life of Jesus, I'd like to consider these questions. First, can you think of one sin that Jesus and in his life as recorded in the gospel writings ever committed? Now, you and I both know you've broken out in anger, and so have I, that we have a moral standard for ourselves that we have at some point in our lives transgressed. But even Jesus' closest followers said that he was without spot and blameless. Philip Schaff wrote, In vain do we look through the entire biography of Jesus for a single stain or slightest shadow on Jesus' moral character. One minute. Second, can it reasonably be denied that Jesus was brutally murdered? No, and I've got the evidence for that. Third, is it true that many of Jesus' closest followers died martyrs' deaths because they said they saw him alive after his death and they saw him in a resurrected body? Yes. 30 seconds. And fourth, do you and I, based on what we know about the character of Jesus, believe that he would take a bullet or a nail, as it were, for every single one of us in this audience for me, for Dr. Shermer, and any one of us. Yes, because ultimately we're not discussing a proposition here. We're discussing a person. And that person is the 
supernatural, all-knowing, loving God as proven by the law of cause and effect, design and morals, and as represented to us in the life of Jesus Christ. God. Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, nice to see you all. Thank you for coming out. A phrase you hear a lot these days on liberal college campuses. Ooh, tough audience. Okay. <laughs> it is acceptable to laugh. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, boss. <laughs> Most of the college campuses I speak at, they don't have somebody like Dr. Hester. So I'm grateful for that because <laughs> those audiences are really tough because <laughs> I'm not a woke progressive. So <laughs> there I'm sweating like a gender studies professor trying to answer the question, what is a woman? <laughs> uh, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> um, Kyle defined God as all powerful, omn omnipotent all-knowing, omniscient, and all-good, omnibenevolent, who created out of nothing the universe and everything in it, himself or itself, uncreated and eternal, a perfect non-corporeal spirit who created, loves, and grants eternal life to us if we select it. How many of you, just show of hands, it's okay to get a show no, of hands. No, it's not okay, no. Really? No, oh. no show of hands. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just curious how many people here believe in God, but I have a sneaking suspicion <laughs> what that is. <laughs> so let me just uh, start with two assumptions then. Uh, that de definition of God I just gave, I'm not God. Would you agree? And you're not either. Yes? Okay. I guess you can't respond. All right. It's all right. <laughs> My conclusion from this, I'm not God and you aren't either, is that none of us knows anything for certain. We say things like 100%, I know for 100%, whatever it is you're talking about, of course, we're just speaking metaphorically. We're kind of trying to convey, I'm really, really sure. But since we're not omniscient, then we don't know for sure. So there's always some doubt, there should be, about any proposition. Even love, for some reason, the example of love always comes up as some sort of exception to a scientific, rational analysis of something. But I don't think that's quite true, because you know what you call love without evidence? Stalking. Okay. I am the enforcer. <laughs> All right. In something called Bayesian reasoning, which has to do with assigning probabilities to things as being likely true or likely not true or undetermined at the moment in some percentage between zero and 100, say between one and 99%. There's something called Cromwell's rule. Oliver Cromwell was the famous English politician who famously said, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you might be mistaken. So in basic reasoning, Cromwell's rule is never assign a zero or a one to any proposition, just in case. So somewhere between one and 99%. For example, UFOs and UAPs you've heard about, I wouldn't say zero percent, I'm pretty skeptical, but I put it like less than 1% that they represent aliens and much higher percent that they represent something else, okay. And so we have to proportion our confidence in a belief based on the evidence. Is the evidence weak? So we should proportion our confidence in it low, our Bayesian credence, as they say, based on our priors. If our priors tell us it's probably not true, then we should have low credence or low belief. If the evidence is quite good and our priors about the evidence are high, then we should have high credence that the proposition is true. This principle of proportionality, that is proportion the confidence in your belief in something according to the evidence. How good is the evidence? Another way to put this, more famously by the great Carl Sagan, is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if I tell you a little story, I came here from Santa Barbara, where I live, and I took a regional airliner out of the Santa Barbara airport to Dallas-Fort Worth to connect 
then connected from Dallas-Fort Worth last night to Montgomery. And an interesting thing happened on that late night connecting flight last night between Dallas and Montgomery. A bright light and huge ship hovered over our airliner. And I was abducted out of my seat and taken up to the mothership in orbit around Earth where I met the Pleiadians who told me that Earthlings have to get their stuff together about global warming and nuclear weapons and so on or else. And then, miraculously, I was put back in my seat and I landed safely in Montgomery. Okay, which part of this story would you need some extraordinary evidence before you would believe? It's obvious, right? You could pretty much take my word for it that I live in Santa Barbara and that we have a little regional airport that connects to Dallas and so forth. You don't really have to fact check that. You can look it up online. Shermer, Santa Barbara, yeah, okay. But for the most part, you could take my word for it. But the other part, you really should demand some evidence. Hang on. You went to the spaceship? Did you like get one of the little knobs from the dashboard? You got something to show us? Because that seems pretty improbable, Shermer. So it would be reasonable for you to argue, uh, I want more evidence than you've given. All right, let me tell you a little story about uh, that Carl Sagan, a little thought experiment Carl liked to, to uh, use as an instrument for expressing these ideas. I have a dragon in my garage. Please stand behind the podium. Okay, boss. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I think we have cameras, right? Yes, all right. Uh, would you like to see the dragon? I mean, we've heard about dragons and myth and stories. It would be fantastic if they were real. So you go, yeah, I want to see it. I, I, I just can't take your word for it. Remember, I got to see this thing, right? So I take it to my garage. I open the garage. You look inside, and there's some old boxes, a couple of bicycles, some paint cans, but you don't see any dragon. And uh, you go, well, where's, where's the dragon? And I go, well, this is an invisible dragon. Oh, an invisible dragon, huh. Well, how about if we sprinkle some flour on the floor, and then when the dragon walks around, we'll get some footprints of the dragon, and then we can see evidence for its existence. And I say, well, <clears throat> now you see, this invisible dragon hovers above the ground two feet. It's a levitating invisible dragon. Oh, well, ah. It's a dragon. It's, it's an animal. It gives off body heat. So what if we take one of those thermometers we use during COVID, you know, that point at people's foreheads to get their temperature. We'll point this thing around the room, and then we can see where the dragon is, maybe the outline of the body of the dragon. Well, no, sorry. This is a cold-blooded dragon. It doesn't give off any heat at all. Well, what about the fire? We know dragons are fire-breathing, so surely we can detect the heat of the fire. Nope. This is cold fire, cold fire. At some point, you got to say, you know, Shermer, come on. Uh, this, this isn't really good, very good evidence. This is just hand-waving away something that may or may not exist. How can you tell the difference between an invisible, levitating, cold-blooded, cold-fire-breathing dragon and no dragon at all? You see where I'm going with this. And you say, well, I say to you, the skeptic of the dragon, but I feel the presence of the dragon in my heart. Yeah, okay. I can imagine if you really believe in the dragon, it would have effect on your emotions. But that's not enough for me to believe that I don't feel anything from the dragon. Well, but, you know, when I pray to the dragon, sometimes good things happen. Yeah, but sometimes good things happen anyway, by chance. How do I know? that the prayers to the dragon are actually a test or you're just remembering the hits and forgetting the misses, the times you prayed and nothing happened or bad things happened and so on. This I contend is the problem with this approach to believing in God. You're taking an evidentiary approach claiming you can prove it's true. In other words, this is in the realm of empirical scientific truths, which I think is a mistake. I think it belongs in the realm of religious truths or mythic truths, truths that have other values other than what science can provide for us. If I ask you, do you think Middle Earth really exists? You know, in Tolkien's trilogy, you'd look at me like I was out of my mind or like Harry Potter's Hogwarts. Is this real? 
But you've missed the point of the story. It isn't about whether there's really Hogwarts or Middle Earth. It's a story that conveys moral homilies and values and it teaches us how to live and how to be in relationship with other people, and right and wrong, and how to deal with our failings and on and on. That's what these stories are about. That's what I mean by mythic truths or religious truths. They're, they're true on their own value. But if somebody you know, says, well, what about the brothers Karamazov, you know, Dostoevsky's great Russian novel, were there really brothers Karamazov in 19th century Russian? You've missed the point of the story. It's not about that, it's fiction. It's fiction with a purpose, okay? And I think this is a mistake to say, well, these religious truths in the Bible have to be accepted scientifically and rationally or else don't believe them. Well, I, I can't ask you for a show of hands, I guess, because so I was, was going to ask you. If it turned out, you can just ask yourself in your, in your own mind that I had the better arguments today and that I could convince you that the evidence for the existence of God in the Bible is weak or non-existent. Would you give up your religion? Would you say, you know what, I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm not going to accept Jesus as my Savior. I think, in fact, I might be an atheist. How many of you would do that? Okay, I know, don't show your hands. <laughs> Just think in your mind, because I, I'm pretty confident I know what the answer is, which is, well, no, because that's not why you believe in the first place. Just think about, since Kyle mentioned, uh, I was on Ben Shapiro's show, I, I know Ben, he's a good friend, he, uh, and I like him a lot. He's not a Christian, he's a Jew. So I asked him on his Sunday special show, why don't you accept Jesus as your savior? And he had a perfectly rational answer, because that's not what the Old Testament predicts. And there's not enough evidence to accept Jesus as our savior. He probably existed, probably crucified, Romans crucified everybody <laughs> for practically anything. So that, that's not an extraordinary claim, that someone named Yeshua, Jesus, existed and was crucified, is a fairly uh, provable, I think. And most of the biblical historians and historians of religion I know, they, they think Jesus existed and was crucified. If you ask, what, did he die for my sins? That's not a scientific empirical truth question. How would you prove that? How would you ever test that? It's just a point of religious belief. You either believe it or you don't. If it's part of your religion, then you believe it. If it's not, not. Jews don't believe that. Why not? Just, just ask yourself that question. You can't say, well, if only they understood the arguments. You know, if they sat down and Kyle walked them through the six points for the resurrection and why it really happened and so on and so forth, They'd believe. No, they wouldn't. They know those arguments. I know they know them because I know these people. These great Jewish rabbis and scholars, they know the arguments. They know all the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and therefore uh, the religious truth behind that is he died for our sins. And so they just don't accept it. They just don't. It's just not that good. Kyle will try to convince you otherwise and that's fine. But just ask yourself, why is it that these great learned scholars who believe in the same God you believe in, they even believe in the same book, at least the Old Testament, <laughs> uh, that you believe in, and yet they still reject that central tenet to what your belief is about Jesus, is, uh, dying for your sins and being you know, resurrected and so forth. Why is that? And that's not to mention Muslims. You know, if you're gonna put your faith confidence, let's say, in the Bible as a source of evidence uh, for God's existence, and there's over two billion Christians in the world, well, there's 1.2 billion Muslims who are quite confident you all are going to hell in this room. You chose the wrong religion. And they are rather fervent about this, at least some of them are, as you may have noticed from recent current events. They believe the Quran is the inspired word of God. And what's the difference? Again, back to the dragon question. I talk to Kyle, he gives me these arguments. I'm quite sure the Bible is the inspired word of God and so forth. I talk to a Muslim, he says, no, 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 that's, that's the wrong holy book. This is the holy book, that's correct. Five minutes. How am I supposed to tell who's right? 
How do you know? In other words, what should we believe and why? Knowledge is defined as justified true belief. What is your justification for your belief? And you can sure, surely give arguments. You've just heard some, which I'll address in a minute or in my rebuttal period. But why is it others don't believe it? If it's so good, you know, Kyle mentioned, you know, science is a, is a good method. Yes, it, indeed it is, especially when we get consensus science about, uh, say, the germ theory of disease or plate tectonics and why continents move around the earth. You know, there's a massive consensus among scientists about this, so it's reasonable for me to accept it, even though I don't go out and drill into the deep earth to, to, to measure the movement of crust and plates that cause earthquakes and so on. It's reasonable for me to accept that. But there's nothing like that for the God question. Not even remotely like, there's no consensus about this. And, and that's not to mention, had we not been born when we were, had we been born 10,000 years ago, none of us would believe in a single God. There was no such thing as monotheism. It was just, well, polytheism at most, or kind of an animated spirit, spiritism. Or if you were born today, but in China or India, or Japan, you, very likely you would not be a Christian. You would believe something else, and you would believe it with the same level of confidence you believe in your Christian religion. Even within Christianity, there's thousands of denominations and sub-denominations and so on. They don't agree on everything. You know, should same-sex marriage be the law of the land? Are you pro-choice or pro-life? What's the right level of immigration into the country? You know, what about euthanasia, okay? Smart, thoughtful, reasonable Christians do not agree on these questions. Why not? Because these are not empirical truth questions that you can achieve a consensus among pretty much everybody, this is the right thing to do. They're a different kind of truth. So given this almost unfathomable level of religious differences, it's obvious that any claim to sole possession of absolute truth of any kind uh, is fleeting. They clearly cannot all be right. All right, let me just address in my last two minutes here. Two minutes. <laughs> Let's see, my psychic powers. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so Kyle's first argument, let's just look, look at that for this was, uh, yeah, uh, every material effect has a cause. The, 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 this argument is, um, dates back to the great um, Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian, Catholic uh, theologian. He had his prime mover and, and first cause arguments. They're pretty much the same, uh, which Kyle uh, thoughtfully articulated quite well. So here's my response to that, the universe is everything that is, ever was, or ever shall be. Thus, God must be within the universe or is the universe. In either case, God would himself need to be moved, or caused, if you will. And thus, the regress to a prime mover just begs the question, well, who moved God, or what moved God? If God does not need to be moved, then clearly not everything in the universe needs to be moved. Maybe the initial creation of the universe was its own prime mover, which happens in quantum effects, One minute. uncaused. In either case, God would himself need to be caused and so forth. So what do we do with these infinite regresses? You don't have to do anything with them because they're not proofs of anything. They're just saying we're hitting an epistemological wall at the end of the regress. Kyle's willing to say, I'm going to end it there and then invoke this supernatural being that kicked it all off. But how do you know the supernatural being exists? Why would I believe that? This is back to the dragon story. Well, I feel the presence of the dragon, you know, so on and so forth. 30 seconds. So I, I contend that, at the very least, just say, you know, I don't know what caused the first cause. And really, that is the scientific answer. Nobody knows. I know nobody knows, because I don't know, I know you don't know, and I know all the scientists that study this, they don't know either. What was there before the Big Bang? We don't know. All right, I'll pick up the other arguments there. Thank you. Our next section will be 10 minutes of rebuttals, beginning with Kyle Butt and then Michael Shermer. None of us knows anything for certain was how his opening statements began. 
I think that's just patently false. I think you do know lots of things for absolute certain. You are sitting here this morning and you know that. The statement, there is no absolute truth, is that true? Because if it is true, then there would be an absolute truth. Now this idea that you're going to try to sweep the arguments for the existence of God under the rug by saying, okay, well, you might think that you do know these things, there might be a high probability that you know these things, but you can't know it. And so that idea, that little bit of doubt, should cause you to recognize that nobody can know anything. That's just simply not true. And so then, you pull Cromwell's idea that you need to put your belief on some type of scale of 1 to 100. That's just simply not how the real world works. And Cromwell's rule, where would you get that rule? Did it come from any naturalistic study of anything? Did it come from... That's a rule that a person made up, and it's not a rule that I would ever follow because I believe you can know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And this is not a probability claim. This is not a, I think this is the case, but not. These are truth statements. And so the idea that, hey, we should just look at this as something that might be probably true or improbably true, I just don't think that is a valid approach to what we're doing today. And the second approach, the second statement he said, made is, well, what, what Kyle's talking about is mythical truth. It's religious truth. It's something that, okay, there might be a couple of people who were, are atheistic have said there's two magisteria, and one of them is the natural world, and the other is the religious world, and you don't get the two crossed. And, and what we're dealing with here is the magisteria of religion and not physical science. Well, that is just simply not how those of old would have come to the conclusion that there is a God and not how I think we should come to the conclusion that there is a God. Let's ask this question. Is it mythical that physical effects must have a cause? No. Is it mythical that things that maintain specified information must have an intelligent designer? No. We're not dealing with mythical things. Your brain is not mythical. The constants of the universe that are nailing down the fact that it is so fine-tuned that there is a reason that atheistic philosophers and people who study the world say that there is a Goldilocks universe, that everything is exactly right. They're not coming at that from some mythical religious belief. That is something that they are arriving at from the conclusions that they're seeing in nature. Now, uh, the Apostle Paul, and there again, I'm not quoting him to prove anything, although, as Dr. Shermer said, I absolutely do believe that the, ins the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and I do believe that we can prove that. I'm not going to quote him to prove that, but I am going to quote him to show you how Christianity comes to the conclusions that it does, or should. And, and let me put this to you. It just, uh, Dr. Shermer said, if it turns out that I've got better arguments for atheism, would anybody in here who is a Christian say, okay, I'm now an atheist? He said, if it turns out that way. Now the assumption is you didn't come to your belief in Christianity based on arguments and that you haven't seen these arguments and that somehow if you were presented with these arguments that then you might decide to become an atheist. The assumption is that's not why you came to your conclusion that God exists. Now un unfortunately, some people do. They do adopt an idea sometimes even a religious belief, not based on evidence, not based on information that would drive you to the conclusion if you're reasoning about it properly. But in Dr. Shermer's writings, he says that the number one reason that people say they believe in God is because the design and the order in the world. And so it's not as if we're standing here and we haven't considered these and we haven't thought through them and we haven't put them together and we might get arguments that... No, no, we do understand that physical effects must have a cause. We do understand that there are objective moral values. We do understand that design demands an intelligent designer. And because of those things, we come to this conclusion. And Thomas Aquinas didn't, didn't make up the, the law of, of or the reasoning from the argument from design and cause and effect. Every house is built by someone. Five minutes.
but he who built all things is God. And so that, that discussion, that way to arrive at the truth that God exists has been around from the beginning of creation. In fact, that's what Paul said, and let me get to that. There in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, he said, For since the beginning of creation, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. And all Paul is saying is you can look at the things that are here and you can come to conclusions about God that you know for sure. Now, do you know everything? about God. I mean, are we saying, hey, we have got this completely figured out in that we know everything? No, but just because you don't know everything doesn't mean you don't know something. And so, can we look at what God has created and see aspects about God that He must be eternal, that He must be supernatural, not part of the material cosmos and university, and that He must be intelligent, He must be a moral person? Yes. Yes, we can do that. Now, he then makes the statement, okay, why don't Jews accept the arguments for Christianity? If they were so powerful and there was such a consensus, why don't Jews accept those? Uh, I think it's interesting. I've got a quote from, Dr., from Christopher Hitchens, rather, the late Christopher Hitchens, who said this, don't take refuge in a false sense of security in consensus. The idea that you're going to, hey, see how many people vote one way or the other and see how qualified they are, and if this many qualified people vote this way, then we're going to take a consensus and we're going to come to that conclusion. Secondly, the idea that Jews don't accept the arguments for Jesus, well, number one, that's an oddly stated statement because if a Jew does accept the arguments for Jesus and the resurrection, what does that Jew become? A Christian. So that would be like saying, well, why don't atheists accept the arguments for the existence of God? Well, the ones who do accept the arguments are no longer atheists. But the next aspect of that is, right now in the world, there is a group of people called Messianic Jews or Messianic Judaism. It's a worldwide thing that's been going on since 1915. And the Messianic Judaism says, we believe that we are Jews, but we accept the Messiahship of Jesus Christ and they are Messianic Jews who do accept the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. Now secondly, oh, I guess this would be thirdly, Christianity rose out of the Jewish nation. In fact, as you watch the progression in the book of Acts, 3,000 people became Christians, were baptized into Christ on the day of Pentecost, and then it went to uh, 5,000, and many of the priests were converted. And then you see Suetonius making a statement that Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome, and most every scholar that I've read believes that's because so many of the Christians were Jews. He was getting Judaism and Christianity mixed up together, and so he just kicked the Jews out. And so the number of Jews that became Christians to start with was very, very large. Two minutes. And then uh, if you look at the idea of Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews, he said, and then Paul went through all the reasons why, I understand my, why my other Jews might not accept Jesus, but here is the evidence and why you should. And so that idea that Jews just don't accept uh, Christ doesn't correspond with how we're trying to do things. How are we trying to do things? And then apply this to the idea of Muslims. Okay, Muslims don't believe you're right. Okay, all we're asking, all we've ever been asking is what was written down almost 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul, test all things and hold on to what is good. What we're saying is do assess the evidence. Take the Quran and take the Bible and use historical textual analysis on both of those and see which one comes out as a superior record of what really happened in history. One minute. You take the life of Jesus and the life of Muhammad and you compare those two. Jesus who said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my people would fight. And not only did Jesus' people not fight, not the ones who were following His commandments and His life example as He stated it, but Jesus' people conquered the world by loving their enemies. And you take any amount of evidentiary-based thinking you want and you compare Christianity to any other system, and, and you compare the Christian documents to any other documents, and what you're going to arrive at, I believe, is the truth if you reason properly about the evidence.
Almighty. Very interesting. Well, if we're just going to do a kind of utilitarian calculus of Christianity versus Islam, given current events, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll choose the life of Jesus versus the life of Muhammad, at least as it's been distorted by Islamists who are different from Muslims, most of who are peaceful. But clearly one can lead to more violence, although I would remind you historically that was not always the case. Christianity went through the Enlightenment and became quite pacified compared to the way, let's say, Christians used to treat Jews. Now, of course, you're sympathetic and you support Israel as you should, uh, and you combat anti-Semitism, but the blood libel goes back thousands of years, well, centuries, particularly to Martin Luther, uh, that the Jews killed Jesus, which I've always found to be a peculiar argument for supporting anti-Semitism, which most anti-Semitics in Europe were Christians. Again, most of you in this room, I assume, are not like that at all because you now have adopted the secular values of treating all people equally, bodily autonomy, individualism, you know, the rights that we all em endorse, which come from the founding fathers and the Constitution and so on, who are Enlightenment philosophers. Clearly not everybody uh, embraces that. Now Kyle's argument about the Jews not accepting Jesus and then the Messianic Jews, these are uh, informally called Jews for Jesus. Okay, yeah, there are some, of course. But the vast majority of the 16.2 million Jews in the world today don't accept Jesus as the Savior, even while acknowledging he probably existed and was crucified. This is not an empirical question, and I beseech you, <laughs> for Oliver Cromwell, you know, don't put your faith and your religious beliefs on that, on some set of arguments. And again, the implication is that, well, they just don't understand. Yes, they do. They do understand the arguments and the evidence presented for the resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb, you know, the women came, went to the tomb and so on, and apparitions after the death to certain people. So they know all those arguments. They've read the books, they've written counter books. It's just not that good, it just isn't. It's an extraordinary claim. 100 billion people have lived and died before the 8 billion people alive today. Not one of them has come back from the dead, except for maybe one, Jesus. So the odds are 100 billion to one. That's a pretty extraordinary claim. Is the evidence proportional to that 100 billion to one odds of this happening? No, it isn't. If it was, I'd believe. Well, I did used to believe. I'll tell you about that in my closing arguments. But I just don't think the evidence is that good. And I, I only bring up the Jews. I could bring up Hindus and Buddhists and all the other world religions who also don't believe it. But it's easier to connect with you on the Jewish question because A, we're sympathetic to them, B, you know that they know the arguments because these great learned scholars and rabbis, they read all this stuff, they know what the arguments are. Okay, so I don't accept that as a counter to that. In any case, as I said, if I had better arguments, you wouldn't abandon your belief in Jesus as your savior. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, for good reason, because it's not an empirical realm. Well, in the Q&A, you can tell me if you would, <laughs> since I'm not allowed to ask, okay. Um, all right, let's look at the, oh, there's no absolute truth. Okay, so I, I, I slightly misspoke or I didn't communicate this clearly. There is absolute truth. L let's say there's, I don't know, 973 people here today. I don't know what it is, but there is or there isn't. We can just count them up. We know absolutely what the, the, the true answer to that question is. How many people are there in this room today? Yep, that's true. What I'm talking about is your knowledge of what is true cannot be 100%. You said so yourself when you nodded when I said, are you God? And you're not, and neither am I. So none of us knows for sure what the absolute truth is. Of course, there is truth to be discovered, but we can't know it. So my argument is for intellectual humility. Just be humble. Just not be quite so absolutely certain of your beliefs, because you might be wrong. And I will say, I have to say, I could be wrong. So if it turns out when I close my eyes for the last time here on this glorious earth and, and I open them up and oh my God, <laughs> there it all is and there's all you and <laughs> whoever would be there. Uh, 
And I, okay, all right. Well, hopefully I'd be the place you are, but maybe I wouldn't since I don't accept Jesus. I don't know what you think about that. But, um, but I, I'm not close to the idea. I, I'm, I, I, like anybody, would like to continue my sentient existence for as long as possible. And, uh, and if that means going to some other realm, some other dimension or some quantum field or some supercomputer where my soul is uploaded, whatever it would be, whatever your version of heaven is, uh, that would be fine. I, I'd be happy to go, oh, I was wrong. Okay, fine. Why didn't I believe? You didn't give me enough evidence. That's why. You gave me a brain to think and I used it and I just couldn't decide. I can't imagine an all-powerful, all-loving God who would say, smite you too bad. I, I just can't imagine any God. I wouldn't want to believe in a God like that. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Let me address the other two points, the objective moral values. Uh, believe it or not, I believe in objective moral values. I do. Not on everything. I mentioned a few. What's the right tax r uh, rate for the upper income br tax bracket? What's the right percentage of immigrants we should allow in the country? And so on. These are political questions that can't be answered empirically. So um, I would not say those are objective moral values. Those depend on what kind of country you want. All right. But if we talk about other things like rape or murder, you know, are those things objectively wrong? Yes, they are. They're objectively wrong. Well, technically, murder is, by definition, the unlawful killing of another person. Okay, so. But how do you know it's wrong? Well, first of all, you don't need God to tell you that. In any case, as I've already mentioned, there are plenty of people in the world who think rape and murder is perfectly good. It's totally justified. God told us to. You've seen this in the news recently, right? This is what they believe. Not many, I don't want to indict all Muslims, but Islamists and these Hamas terrorists, this is what they believe, and they think God told them this. This is the problem when you anchor your moral values in the supernatural. How do you convince somebody who believes that a supernatural being told them this is okay? All right, so instead of asking God, how about ask the affected person? How would you feel about having your genitals mutilated. You've heard of this, female genital mutilation. Is this wrong? Yes, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong, and we should do whatever we can to stop it, even if that means intervening in other people's countries. All right, that's what the implications are of an objective moral standard. The well-being and flourishing of sentient beings. Can they suffer? Do they suffer? The reduction of suffering and the enhancement of flourishing is where we begin with bodily autonomy. It's your body, it's your mind. They're your thoughts. They belong to you and nobody else. No other collective, nation, ideology, cult of any kind has control over you. Two minutes. Here I'm talking about adults, rational adults, not children and so forth. My position, by the way, as an atheist is that that's rare. Most Atheists you know, do not believe in objective moral values, but I do, and I wrote a whole book about uh, justifying that. But even if I'm wrong, and back to the, you know, how do you know what these objective moral values are? Is rape and murder wrong because God said so? Well, first of all, which God are you talking to? Which holy book, unfortunately, the creator of the universe wrote more than one holy book, so which is the one? Is it two billion on one, a billion on the other? You know, consensus is not gonna get us there. Is rape and murder wrong because God said so? Well, what if he hadn't said so? What if he wasn't super clear about that? Do you know why it's wrong? Can you articulate without giving a, rash, a, a religious argument or a supernatural argument, why it's wrong? Just ask yourself that in your mind. Can, can, you, can you explain why it's wrong? I can, I, I wrote a whole book about this, The Moral Art. But in any case, if rape and murder is really wrong, which it is, why do we need God to tell us this? Why not just give us the reasons and skip the middleman? If it's really wrong, just say, here's the argument for why. Why doesn't the Holy Book tell us that? Other than just commanding it, and, and here I, I'll wait till later to get into some of the less questionable moral values promoted in, in the Old Testament. Um, okay, then in, I guess in my final comments, I'll, I'll talk about the 
the, design, the apparent good design and intelligent design, it isn't. And I'll address that in the next round. Thank you. We will have cross-examinations. 10 minutes for Kyle Butt and 10 minutes for Michael Shermer. Dr. Shermer, just if you don't mind, in one or two sentences, because I know you could go on for a while about this, but would you summarize your primary reason for not believing in God? The lack of evidence. Okay. All right. Sufficient evidence, I should say. Okay. I mean, you, now, got your, you, you have some good arguments. I'm not saying they're bad arguments. They're just not sufficient. Got you. Okay. Uh, on a scale of zero or one to a hundred of belief, like you're talking about the Bayesian, uh, where would you put your unbelief? You don't believe in God as a 49%, 62%? All right, here's how I, th I think about this. Uh, again, we have the ontological question of is there really a God out there or not? And then the epistemological question, what do I know about that reality? So uh, ontologically speaking, I don't see how we can derive certainty uh, one way or the other. I agree with Thomas Henry Huxley, who coined the term agnosticism. Not, I'm not sure, but it's not knowable in any scientific way. Practically speaking, the way I live my life, I assume there is no God. I act like there isn't, I'm quite certain, I don't put a percentage on it, I just say very unlikely. Okay, all right, um, last October, you're on the Joe Rogan Show and you guys were talking about uh, aliens. And he <laughs> said, do, do you believe aliens exist? And you said, and I'm, I'm gonna quote this, I am 99.9 .9 percent sure that aliens are out there, no matter how improbable, but I just haven't seen evidence for them here on planet Earth. And so I guess my question would be, you know, how would you be 99.9% .9 sure that there are aliens, but then say, I haven't ever seen any evidence for them on planet Earth? Yeah, it, and low, low probability for yeah. the existence of an eternal Yeah, creator. it's a good question. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. There, the percentage number I put on it for Joe is just more of a, you know, emphasizing the point. I think there's really good arguments for the existence of extraterrestrial intelligences out there somewhere, just based on the raw numbers. Hundreds of billions of galaxies, each of which has hundreds of billions of stars, each of which has dozens of planets, and so on. There turns out to be trillions and trillions of planets. The odds of none of them having all the same features our planet has, the Goldilocks distance, water, the temperature, and so on and so forth, uh, is pretty low. So the, 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 I think it would be anthrop anthropocentrically hubris for us to think we're the only ones in the vast country. That's all I meant by that. Have they come here? Again, like on the, the dragon question or the God question, you know, we have 75 years of government and intelligence agencies and professional astronomers looking for sub substantial evidence that we have been visited. It's just not there. I know because I've read everything. I've looked at all the evidence. I, I'm on these, like the Galileo Project, I'm on these boards that investigate UFOs. And it's just not there. And to me, the whole UFO thing, it is like a religion. People seem to either believe it or they don't, <laughs> regardless of the evidence. And all I'm saying is, I don't know. They're probably not here, but I'll change my mind tomorrow if my example is the Chinese spy balloon. Remember the Chinese spy balloon last April, you know, flying over North America. You know, there it is. Uh, our jets photographed it, our satellites photographed it, people on the ground photographed it, the Navy jet shot it down, and the President and the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, the Pentagon all said it's real. That's all I would have to, to, to be convinced aliens are real. What have you got like that for God? Well, um this, this, uh, we'll get to that in my question and answers. Uh, I, I, I would just contend the, the material, the material that I have presented would be the evidence that we would need. But okay, next question. In your book, Conspiracy, you mentioned Jonathan Roch's Constitution of Knowledge. And his ninth point, this is, is Conspiracy your newest book? Is that the latest yeah. one out? Yeah. And his ninth point is that a person needs to make a commitment to naturalism. 
And I guess what, what I'm trying to get at is I think that's why you would say I believe in aliens but I don't believe in God is because it seems like you have made a commitment to naturalism. What does that mean to you, yeah. a commitment to naturalism? Yeah, sometimes it's called methodological nat naturalism. That is, natural effects have natural causes. As opposed to what? Yes, it's an assumption. It's true. Uh, but this is a little bit like asking, is it rational to be rational? That's, Five minutes. That's, you know, one, one thought too many. It, it's, it's just something you do. You just, that's what we do. It's a tool. And um, I'm sorry, I lost the thread. What was it? No, that, yes. I was just saying, so you approach the situation, the discussion. Oh, naturalism, here, yeah, sorry. And just yeah, have yeah. you, like when you say you make a commitment to it, what's that mean to make well, a commitment to it? Well, make a commitment that I assume natural effects have natural causes. Now, they may have supernatural causes. There could be something outside of space and time, but how would I know? Because I'm in space and time. How, this, is a, uh, this is a serious problem for, for theists who believe, or any supernaturalist, could be people who believe in ESP or whatever. How does the supernatural being enter into the material world to stir the particles in some way? Like to say, to, to promote, perform a miracle, to cure cancer, to go right into the cells and, and destroy the tumorous cells, whatever the deity does in that case. How does God do that? And, and so, and, and so I, I, you can answer if you, I mean, that's a hard problem. How, and how do you know something supernatural even exists? It's just a word we're using uh, to explain the supernatural, the paranormal. That doesn't explain it. it. It's just a word. It's like saying the dragon did it. How do you know it's there? Well, I feel the presence of the dragon. Well, that's not sufficient evidence for me to believe it. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with, I think I've, I've read that you have studied some of Paul Bloom's stuff. And the stuff that he has about children being born into the world as natural teleologists. Here's what he says. There's by now a large body of research suggesting that humans are natural born creationists. And then Richard Dawkins said, it's as if the human brain were specifically designed to misunderstand Darwinism. Are you familiar with that research? And what, yeah. what explanation is given from an unbelieving side that says, okay, it looks like children are born with a brain that's designed not to believe in naturalistic causes, but we just say they are. What, what's the, what would you say is the natural Yeah, the okay, so this is, um, Paul Bloom's a developmental psychologist who works with children, very young children. Uh, and from a very early age, they, they have a sense of uh, detecting patterns and infusing those patterns with intentional agency. Like there's something alive about the pattern. There's something in it, like little, um, little puppet shows you could play with these children where the little mouse gets munched by the alligator. Where's the mouse now? Well, children have this kind of natural born dualism that, that there is body and soul, there's brain and mind, there's corporeal and incorporeal. It's a natural uh, tendency we all have. Uh, whether it's true or not is a separate question. It's just that's what we're born with. But by the way, children are also front-loaded with a sense of right and wrong. You can have the, the, the nice puppet and the mean puppet, and the nice puppet's trying to push the ball up the ramp, and the mean puppet comes over there and, and, and pushes it back down, and then you ask the children which one they like to play with. These are, it's like, these are pre-verbal children. They can't tell you who's right and wrong, but they, they respond in a positive way to the nice puppet. They respond in a punishing way to the bad puppet. So uh, my argument is that human nature gives us a lot of already born with values and assumptions about the world. Two minutes. And one of those is that it seems like there's an invisible intentional agent out there. You know, gods, demons, angels, aliens, you know, whatever. There's just conspiracy, you know, it's just invisible things are out there. Whether they are or not, that's a separate question, but that's... So I call that patternicity and agenticity, the tendency to assume in invisible agents are out there acting against us or for us. Okay. Uh, in the, uh, 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 you are a, a trained cyclist and have been doing that a lot of times. And I was, I was trying to put my, my mind around how you say, hey, this life is where it should be. Even if there is a God, I'm gonna focus on this life. And I was interested there in the Shapiro show when you started talking to him about having trained for a really long race 
and you said it was really hard and it wasn't fun at all, but afterward, the effects and what it brought to your life were good, and so you felt like it was worth doing. Minute. So if there is an afterlife, wouldn't it be the case just from, from that point of view to train hard, just put that in quotation, et cetera, for the later effects <laughs> to be sure. good? <laughs> My point there, though, was that whether, there, whether there's a, an afterlife or not, whether there's a God or not, there's certain things we should do anyway, just for their own value. Like, you know, be nice to other people. Be a moral good person. It'll make you a better person by acting. This is Aristotle's virtue ethics. By acting virtuous, you will become more virtuous. You will feel virtuous. Whether you get rewarded in the next life, who knows? Irrelevant. Now is what counts. I call this Alvy's error, Alvy Singer's Woody Allen's character in Annie Hall. Time. Oh, such a good story. <laughs> Now your turn. All right, I'll finish my story. <laughs> and then ask you the question. Because um, I, the, I think the error being made here, I call this Alvy's error, is assessing things at the wrong level. So anyway, uh, Alvy Singer's character in Annie Hall has a flashback to childhood where he won't do his homework. He's like eight years old, and, and his mother says, you know, takes him to the psychiatrist, why won't you do your homework? And he says, the universe is expanding. And the universe is everything there is, and one day it's just gonna all blow up, so what's the point of doing my homework? And their mother upbraids him and says, we live in Brooklyn, Brooklyn's not expanding. You gotta do your homework, right? So, <laughs> we don't live in the hereafter. We live here and now. This is what counts. Make it count. If you get rewarded later, whatever, okay, fine. But, but assessing like, does it really matter that the Nazis gas Jews if in 14 billion years the universe is dying? Address your questions no to God? Kyle Butt, please. Does it really matter? You're making an argument. Go ahead. Uh, I think this is, and as, have I, as I've uh, looked at your writings and many of the writings of the atheist, that the, the idea of purpose is one of the failings that unbelief has. That you're right, if there is no God in 14 billion years, although that deep time I wouldn't even adhere to, but in 14 billion years, if everything's going to blow up, what did they do wrong compared to what Jesus did? And I think there is an objective standard of justice that shows no, number one, yes, on this planet, in their real life action, they did something wrong. and what is the purpose of a life that is not understood to be a life that is going to have an eternal destination. And Albert Camus wrote a book called The Death of Sisyphus as he was discussing this. And he said, really for the materialist, the only question that a person arrives at that each day when they wake up is why don't I commit suicide? because there is no ultimate moral point, there is no ultimate goal in life, that if you're moral, okay, great, nothing's gonna happen to you when you die. If you're immoral, nothing's going to happen to you die when you die. And I think that's then why Charles Darwin said, if a man doesn't have a belief in an eternal destination or a personal God, he can have for his mode of operation only to follow the instincts and impulses which seem the best to him. And so I think that's one of the major failings Kyle, of atheism. Let me ask you, okay. are you nice to your wife because of some afterlife that's portending in your distant future? Or are you just nice to her because you love her and that's the loving thing to do? My wife is one of the kindest, sweetest women in the world and is a really uh, wonderful person. If you would switch that question around and say, why is she nice to me? Now that would be a real discussion. No laughing. And, <laughs> And, uh, I did say you can laugh. Oh, that's so right. Okay. You know, what I, would, what I would say about that is, I believe sometimes my wife does not want to be nice to me. And from what I have done, some very, you know, silly things and that stupid stuff that I've done, that if you are just on a, on a rational, reasonable basis, should you be nice to this guy after he blew up half of your house? Because after you told him not to. Okay, no, I don't know of any rational reason to do that. But because... I know that there is a God whose nature is this, then I am going to love my enemies. You know, if you were to look at the, the rationalization behind loving your enemies, 
uh, lots of times I, I've read a, a bunch of your uh, uh, game theory stuff, and, and you just don't, you don't come to a rational conclusion that it's a good idea to love your enemies. In fact, you have said, and I've got the documentation that if you were to always do unto others what you want them to do, a Jesus ethic or a Gandhian ethic, you called it, that if you did that, those people who don't believe, with, in, believe your ethic will just plow over you and destroy you and kill you. You can be exploited. But let me ask you something. Back, back to the, the, the rape and murder example and, and, and objective moral values. Five minutes. Where do you get objective moral values? What makes them objective? Why is rape and murder wrong? Okay. And here's, as I've, as I've read your material, here's where I think we, we differ. Here's where I think the real uh, issue is. Uh, you put forward a foundation for your ethical system, which is the, uh, could, would you put in your words? You, yes, I know you survival and flourishing well-being of sentient beings like us. Okay, the survival and flourishing of sentient well-beings like ourselves. Lack of suffering. Lack of suffering. And if this world is all that there is, then you could make a loose case for that. But if there's more to this existence, if you actually do have a soul, if you actually are going to a place that's going to have an eternal destination, then stopping your discussion of morals at the physical life point would be problematic. And so that is why when Justin Martyr in what 170 AD was going to his death to be beheaded, and he said of the Christians, they can kill us, but they can't hurt us. Well, how can he say, I'm about to get my head chopped off, but I'm not going to be hurt at all. It's because there's an ethic that stems from the nature of God that takes total existence into consideration. Did, did you answer the question, why is rape and murder wrong? Just give me Okay, a, here you go. Because, because there's an ethic ex that comes from the nature of God that takes into account the total existence of a human. But how do you know that personally? Do you pray? Do you read it in the book? Does God talk okay. to you and yes. say, Kyle, murder is wrong? Um, yes, God talks to me in the sense of the New Testament documents that I read. If you read the book of Hebrews, it says in latter times, God spoke to people in different ways, but in these times, He talks to us through His Son, and ultimately, that is through the New Testament documents. Okay. And so, yes, a proper interpretation Good. of the New Testament documents would lead you to the conclusion that the things that are wrong are wrong. Okay, Exodus twenty-two eighteen: Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Do you believe in witches, and should we kill them? Okay, great question. As you look at the Old Testament, it's very easy to take one statement out of context and then apply that to a discussion when I only got two minutes. But let's look at that. Did in the Old Testament, God had established a theocracy, which was a government in which he was going to have to regulate everything, including uh, sanitation things, including food regulations, etc. And so was it the case that many of the nations around the children of Israel were practicing sorcery and a large part of that was sacrifice and lots of it was human sacrifice, sacrificing their children to the god Molech? Yes. And so when we think of the idea of, writ of witch, it's Halloween and we're thinking about uh, hocus pocus and you're thinking about what's going on, but that statement often would have included a person who believed in a system that allowed for human sacrifice. Two minutes. Leviticus 20, 13, if a man lies with another man, he must be stoned. Now to me, this is an endorsement of same-sex marriage and the legalization of pot. But I have a feeling <laughs> uh, you interpret this uh, slightly differently. Yes, I do. And here's what I would say. I've got a, a, a document here that talks about the effects that come with practicing homosexuality. Uh, right now in the United States, we've got some 33 different sexually transmitted diseases. At any time, you've got 65 million people in the United States that have, have, have uh, HPV. Sexually transmitted diseases were, are a very serious thing as far as health goes. We've got some medicine stuff that can take care of some of them now. In the past, they didn't. If you then look 
at the negative consequences, physical, just physical negative consequences that come from practicing homosexuality, you will see that the syphilis rate in the last, um, I think it's 20 years, has gone up by 365 percent in the male Most practicing STDs homosexual. Most STDs are transmitted through heterosexual sex. Okay, that's when people don't use condoms. Okay. I mean, we know this. The spread of AIDS in Africa is not through gays. It's through unprotected sex. Okay, in the um, statements that I've had, that I have here, that I can read them later, the effects of, the physical effects of, of homosexual behavior can be extremely, extremely negative. And I think God was also regulating the moral effects of that. And so do I believe that that should be put into... Uh, practice now where you go to the New Testament the Bible says the Old Testament has been done away with were there good reasons for that statement at the time it was written yes I believe there were and what do you believe now do you think time that ends the cross examination and now we're going to have 20 minutes of open questions from the audience Dr. Shermer what would it take for you to believe there is a God and Mr. Butt what would it take for you to believe there is not a God yeah, good question. Okay, so um, the problem I have, back to that ontological question of is there really a God out there, if it's a supernatural being outside of space and time, how would I know that it really exists? Because I'm in space and time. So let's say, back to the UFO question, let's say there's, uh, we encounter an extraterrestrial intelligence uh, of sufficient advancement. It, it appears, relatively speaking, omniscient, omnipotent, can create life forms, engineer planets, uh, Biogeoengineer uh, planets make them Earth-like. It can create uh, new solar systems out of collapsing uh, stars and, and maybe even universes out of collapsing black holes. And so these are all kind of sci-fi scenarios. Uh, what would be the difference between a sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence and the word we use, God, to describe this omniscient, omnipotent being? I don't see any difference. Okay, just a little bit to respond to that. Uh, Stephen Mayer has has responded to that in that I think Shermer has it, Shermer's last law that basically says, hey, uh, if we find some supernatural intelligence, what would be the difference between that intelligence and God? And I would suggest that there's be a huge difference. And the first aspect of that would just simply be that a being inside of the universe can't be the cause of the universe. You have to have a supernatural eternal being that causes the universe. So any alien life form and I would say that I think that that is is based on an assumption a commitment to naturalism that somehow life evolved from non-living chemicals over multiplied millions of years and we haven't even seen that on planet earth so and it, it, we've actually seen the opposite of that and much less on other planets and so but now what what it would take for me to not believe in God number one God specifically and intentionally centered Christianity in the physical world one minute with the life teachings death and resurrection of jesus christ if you could show some reason other than a commitment to naturalism virtually well everyone everyone i've ever seen that argues well, well i won't say everyone don't make it absolute but all the arguments against jesus and the resurrection are based on a prior commitment to naturalism hey i don't believe in a god and so this couldn't be the case or I don't believe miracles happen and this couldn't be the case. And so if you could prove that Jesus did not rise from the dead, what did Paul say would be the case? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we are of all men most pitiful, most pitiable. Yeah, that's true. But you can prove that Jesus rose from the dead. You can prove that the world had a cause that has to be supernatural. You can prove that there are objective moral values. You can prove that design demands a designer. And so those things would have to be disproven to show that God doesn't Time. exist. All right, I've got a question for each of you. So, Mr. Butt, uh, if God exists and he is a loving God, why is there pain and suffering? And for Dr. Shermer, why would it be God's responsibility to make humans perfect if he to exists? To make what? To make humans perfect. Well, oh yeah. First question. Okay, if there's a loving God, why would he allow suffering? Uh, that has been the question that has raged for so many, many decades. In fact, Job dealt with that question in a very, very serious way. Uh, to say that I'm going to answer this question in two minutes, now one minute and 32 seconds, is going to be problematic. It's not going to get answered 
Dr. Bart Ehrman and I had an entire debate about that, and you could watch that, and it's about two hours like the format of this. Uh, here's what I would say on that. Lots of times we've shown logically that you can't use the argument of evil, pain, and suffering against God logically. And then the emotional argument comes up, well, where is God when I suffer? Why doesn't he do th something? The answer to that, I believe, and always has been, that God is the same place that he was when he allowed his son Jesus to die on the cross. What he was doing with Christ was giving us an answer to the problem of pain and suffering, and that is, you don't always know why I do things. 30 seconds. But if you will trust me, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, but afterward he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. The what comes after suffering seen in Jesus Christ is ultimately the answer. Yeah, I just don't buy it. I mean, childhood leukemia, you know, the poor, miserable, suffering children, and then they die, and then their parents' lives are uh, in grief for the rest of their lives. And this is because God works in mysterious ways. He could have done something about it. He does apparently all the time because people talk about the miracles of God. They prayed for their family member's cancer and the cancer went away. It's a miracle. Why doesn't he do something about that little girl right there who's dying of leukemia? Why not? Well, he works in mysterious way. You know, he's got a bigger plan. This will strengthen the parents. Oh, thanks a lot. You know, can't I learn some moral character and strength from some other method other than killing my kid? Really? That's it? Who would want to believe in a God like that? Not me. Okay, my, the question, I didn't quite understand it. Why would God make us perfect or something like that? He, he did, uh, there is no God. He didn't make us. We evolved. One minute. And we're not perfect. We're far from it. You're saving your time. Yep. Uh, but, well, let's have him. Yeah, he's got one minute of time. Oh. Oh, well, I, oh, oh, I, well, I'll take my time. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I had it. So, this priest and rabbi <coughs> uh, walk into a bar. No. No. <laughs> okay. I really do think the uh, problem of evil, theodicy, is the biggest um, obstacle for religious people, particularly Christians. If you believe in an omniscient, omnipotent, um, omnibenevolent God, why is there suffering? Not talking about, like, murder or genocide. You know, humans have free will. Okay. Uh, just natural evil, just seconds. cancer and so on. Why? What's the point of this? I, I, to me, it just seems, if, if not a refutation of a supernatural being who has these characteristics, it's certainly not one that I would want to believe in. Okay, Dr. Shermer, you've spoken of consensus, you've spoken of uh, empirical, uh, that, that your knowledge is based on empirical things. Uh, you say natural effects have natural causes. Uh, I need to know the source in your mind of conscious activity. Uh, where did consciousness arrive from? Metaphysical first principles, for example, the principle of excluded middle, principle of non-contradiction, principle of causality, those things. Uh, where did these things come from, the logical laws of thought? Yeah, yeah sure. That's a great question. It's, it's called the hard problem of consciousness, uh, which is more than just how does the circuitry work to produce like I can recognize your face because of the fusiform gyrus in my temporal lobe and these neural networks fire and I recognize a face, two dots and a mouth and so on. Uh, what the hard problem is asking uh, is what's it like to be the circuitry itself? And I think it's not an answerable question. I think it's a conceptual problem, namely a problem with the concepts. What's it like to be a bat? Well, maybe I could strap on some echolocation you know, big ears and, and have a little beeping system and I get some uh, echo feedback and I can kind of tell directionality. But, you know, that's a, bare, a, a crude approximation of what it's like to be a bat. So I do more and I keep out, or, or a dolphin or whatever. And, and at some point, I would no longer be a human asking what it's like to be a bat or a dolphin or you. Uh, I would just be a dolphin or a bat. I wouldn't, it, it, the whole thing is premised on this false dualism that there's a little homunculus, a little mini me inside me that goes over into your skull to see if the red looks like uh, my red on your Cartesian theater of your mind, and that's not possible. I think the whole thing is, is a deeply flawed idea, the hard problem of consciousness. Okay, I, I don't think it's a hard problem to arrive at an answer and a correct answer. I think it's a hard problem to arrive at a correct answer if you make a commitment to naturalism. If you say there's no soul, if you say God did not endow each human being with a soul and then ultimately the consciousness that we have, 
I think if you apply this to what was being said at the creation, when God created man, seconds. and he made a distinction between man and the animals, and he said that he created man in his own image, in the image and likeness of God, he created him. And there's a very good reason we're conscious. There's a very good reason we have free will. There's a very good reason we have objective moral standards and we can understand that type of thinking. It's because we've been created in the image of God. Next question. Okay, um, is there any way to get this? Sorry. Okay, my question is for you. As you said, you believe in objective morality by what you said about your reasons for objective morality. Um, because of that, um, if it doesn't come from God, then where does it come from? We evolved it as a social primate species. We have to get along with each other. So you have to interact with others. We know each of us has selfish motives. And if you do the kind of game theoretic calculation that this person is gonna to wanna to exploit me or is gonna want what's best for them, but they know that I have the same motives and they know that I know that they have those motives and so on, it behooves us to cooperate, to be pro-social, to be altruistic, to be kind, to be nice. And it's not enough to fake doing that because we're also fairly good at detecting like psychopaths and sociopaths who fake being nice and they're just gonna exploit you. You actually have to feel it and believe it and do it. Again, back to Aristotle's um, virtue ethics. You just carry out the action and you'll start to feel like a better person. Like, I really care about this person. So for my friends and family who I love, you know, I don't do it in some calculated way. I do it because I feel that way. That's where it comes from. Okay, in this discussion, I think that's a great question. And Dr. Shermer's had several full debates on that. Where do you get the idea of an objective moral standard? I believe that unbelievers who are honest with the implications of naturalism say that you cannot do that. That objective moral standards cannot exist in a world where God does not exist or a supernatural being does not exist. And so they then just say we don't have them. 30 seconds. Now, uh, Matt Ridley in his origin of, you know, Origins of Virtue, he said, so the first thing we should do, do to create a good society now, he's an atheist, is to conceal the truth about humankind's propensity for self-interest, the better to delude our fellows into thinking they are noble savages. He said, when we talk about this, the best thing just to do is say, hey, we all know this stuff, but we don't know this stuff. Uh, like I was reading, uh, one person said, hey, in some countries you are kind to your neighbor, in some countries you eat them, which do you prefer? Time. Well. Next questioner. Uh, Mr. Shermer, you said, and I think correctly, that we would all agree that the odds of Jesus Christ coming back from the dead would be about 1 in 16 billion. But doesn't that sort of create a catch-22 because the very significance of that, because if people did sometimes spontaneously come back from the dead, that would mean the resurrection of Jesus Christ was nothing special. So isn't it unfair to criticize a miracle for the fact that the odds are against it when the fact that the odds are against it is the very thing that makes it, makes it significant? Interesting, yeah. Let's think about this for a second. So I, I, I put, the number I put was 100 billion to one. So first of all, there's, you know, did it really happen or not? But the harder question is, how do you know whether it happened or not? Should I believe that or not? Well, first of all, that's not the only claim to bringing people back from the dead. That used to happen all the time in biblical times. Uh, and even all the way up in the mid 20th century, Satya Sai Baba, uh, the fakir in, guru in India, uh, alleged, allegedly brought people back from the dead. Now, Christians don't believe this. Why not? He had millions of people who said they saw it happen with their own eyes. And that's barely half a century ago, much less 2,000 years ago. So to me, it's very unlikely that this ever happens at all. And our uh, evidence for it is pretty slim. Not enough to tip me over into a belief in it. Okay, there again, I think this is a commitment to naturalism. Like he says, okay, 100 billion to one, 108 billion now, I think, with the calculation of 8 billion people on the planet. If you look at the chance that a very small DNA segment that could give us a novel, new, single fold of a protein actually naturalistically ever happened. And that's what you'd have to do you'd, multiple times to get a, a living organism from non-living chemicals. 30 seconds. The chance of that is a one with 70 zeros behind it. 100 billion would be a one with, what, 11 zeros behind it. 
And so it's not that he doesn't believe in huge probability differences, etc. It's that there's been a commitment to naturalism. And when you take the historic evidence and you apply it to Jesus, and he has on record several good examples of how historic evidence gives us real noble truth, then you can see, yes, the resurrection of Jesus makes perfect sense. Time. Next questioner. Thank you, Dr. Shermer, for being here. So many philosophers have said that the logical consequence of a materialistic universe is that everything must be determined biologically and by necessity, we'll say. And I think that you have taken a uh, publicly a compatibilist viewpoint. So if everything is determined, how are you free and what empirical evidence do you have for that? Yeah. So uh, he's articulated the free will determinism problem. The uh, middle position there is called compatibilism. My version of it is that, yes, we live in a, a determined universe, but we're part of the causal net of the determined universe in which we can learn from the past and change our futures. We can choose, we can self-determine our future actions. And from there, you have volition in which you can be held accountable for your actions, and you should be. Unless there's mitigating circumstances, you got the tumor that caused you to be violent or whatever, the law takes this into account. You're, you have addictions or, you know, there's some chemical wiring. But given a normal range of uh, human cognition and so on, most of us could learn from the past. My one assumption here is that the universe is not predetermined. It wasn't predetermined 13.8 billion years ago at the moment of the Big Bang that you and I would all be sitting here at this moment. One minute. <laughs> uh, but that uh, it's not, the, the future is not exactly like the past. So uh, the free will question turns on, could you have done otherwise? The answer is yes, of course you could do otherwise. Now, if, it's, if, if it was predetermined and that the, the, you know, the past, the, you know, rewind the tape and play it again, could you have done differently? No, because if the tape is just a recording of what happened, then obviously I can't do anything about it. But the future is never going to be exactly like the past. And you can learn from that and say, I'm going to do something different next time. Under these similar circumstances in this environment, I'm going to do X instead of Y, because the last time I did that, that was a, a mistake. And from there, we have the whole basis of civil society, uh, criminal justice system, and holding people accountable for their actions, which we absolutely must do. All right, it's this part of his writings and talking with other atheists, et cetera, that I have really been having trouble nailing down what, what this looks like. And what I mean by that is, Okay, William Provine, Sam Harris, a uh, doctor that he just recently talked to on his show, Robert Sapolsky, uh, Jerry Coyne, they all say you can't get free will from a materialistic point of view. It's impossible. It's logically impossible. I thought Sapolsky did a great job of nailing that down. 30 seconds. Now, uh, on the Ben Shapiro show, uh, Dr. Shermer said, well, free will is it's not really free. It's an illusion. It's an illusion that you're free because, and here, he, here's what he says, along these lines, here's one that works for me. Maybe it works. Free will is a useful fiction. I feel as if I have free will, and even though I live in a determined universe. And so basically what I understand his idea of free will is you just don't know why you do stuff, but there's stuff that causes it, so you're not really doing it, but Nine. we can. Dr. Shermer, uh, in your lifetime, is there someone or something and one event or multiple events that has led you to what you believe? Well, <laughs> okay, let's have an autobiography here. Uh, <laughs> I'll make a few comments on that uh, now and then in my closing remarks. I wasn't raised religious. My parents were uh, not religious or they weren't anti-religious. They weren't anything. Uh, but I became a born-again Christian in uh, 1971 when I was in high school. And I took it pretty seriously. I went to Pepperdine University, a major in theology originally. It's a Church of Christ school. Um, it didn't hurt that it was in Malibu. <laughs> I didn't mind that uh, part. That made it pretty nice. Uh, but I took it pretty seriously for about seven years. Uh, several things. Um, the study of, in graduate school, the study of, well, first evolutionary biology. Evolution really did happen. Uh, comparative, anthro comparative world religions, classes in that. Comparative mythology. You know, people all over the world uh, believe very differently than I did. And I thought, what are the chances that I got it right and all these other people are wrong? You know, minute. maybe I should be, you know, a little more intellectually uh, humble about my beliefs. And then the problem of evil, uh, I've written about this, so I, I don't mind telling you. So I had a, my sweetheart in college, uh, Maureen is her name. She was in a car accident and 
Um, and when I, when I was kind of on the way out of religion, and she broke, it broke her back, and she was paralyzed for life. She's still, still paralyzed. And, uh, you know, I just was just so shattered by this. It was horrible. You know, I'm just there every day, all day in the e ER. She's hanging upside down with the oxygen and all this. And I was just prayed for her, you know, and nothing happened, of course. It wasn't a big test, like, okay, this is it. If, you know, Maureen gets healed, I'll believe in God. If not, not. It wasn't like that. I just felt so bad for her. I thought, what kind of a loving God would not just fix this problem? I mean, come on. This is, and she's a Christian. We went to Pepperdine together. The, anyway, that was kind of the last straw for me. And that was emblematic of the problem of evil. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. I didn't know that about Maureen. And I think all of us can hurt with that and understand how we would feel with that and maybe not empathize because we hadn't been in that situation but certainly sympathize but taking that idea and then saying therefore God doesn't exist I think many many people have been in situations like that seconds. where their pain, their suffering didn't drive them farther away from God, but drove them closer to a loving God who can make everything right in the end. And I think that is an aspect of what we, we rage against that. And if there's nothing after this, that seems totally unfair, totally not right. But if there is something after this, then our light affliction, which is but for a moment, can be working for us a far more eternal and weight of glory. We just have God. to make sure. Thank you for uh, volunteering for the interrogation, Dr. Shermer, but uh, <laughs> I also have a question for you. You advocated for the science consensus, or consensus science, you said, to the credibility of an argument, and you specifically mentioned germ theory, uh, but until relatively recent uh, times in human history, science was uh, passionately opposed to germ theory. Um, so. Should we then accept on the basis of consensus the arguments just because people agree to it? Yeah, it's a good, good question because it, it, it gets into the kind of sociology of science. How does it work? It's a, a very community, com, com, communal process in the sense of you have to have competing ideas. Again, none of us are God. I don't know for sure. Nobody does. People have different ideas. They often conflict. How do we know who's right? And scientists often get it wrong. So working alone in their lab is a bad idea because you know you may not be uh, your best critic. So it's good to have colleagues that you bounce ideas off, publish in peer review, go to conferences and bounce your ideas off, and so on, and have a you know a, a, a team and a B team that uh, push against each other to see which arguments are better, and so on. You have to do that, and even with all that, uh, scientists still get it wrong a lot. Just take the recent COVID masks, whatever. Oh, it's a mandate, mass mandate. There's a consensus that was never true. You know, so yeah, there's a problem with the system. Uh, but uh, what other alternatives do we have? One minute. You know, just how I feel about things, you know? And so uh, it's always changing. The chances of the Big Bang Theory being wrong, you know, not, not high, it's probably true, but it could be, it could be overturned. You know, so we shouldn't take anything as absolute truth just because there's a consensus. The consensus can be wrong. It's just that, you know, if there's a lot of competition between scientists pushing back against each other, then it nudges up my credence that the idea is provisionally true with a small t. Could be wrong. Keep an open mind just in case. All right. I would like to suggest that many, many times consensus is absolutely wrong and that the person who has presented the truth has been silenced for some reason or another. You know, I've got this quote from Good and Evil from Dr. Shermer. In point of fact, of course, all scientists have an agenda. And the sooner we recognize that fact and come clean with our own, the better able the public will be to judge scientific theories. And I do think there's an agenda now. And I think that agenda is a commitment to naturalism. And so as we see, uh, you go back to Numbers chapter 19 with the water purification, the understanding of germ theory was in the book of Numbers in 1450 B.C., and it really didn't get accepted and adopted until, what, 1868 after Ignaz Semmelweis figured out some stuff and Joseph Lister, et cetera. So if, if they had taken what was, what was in the text, germ theory would have been much more accepted sooner and saved hundreds of thousands of millions of lives. So consensus, I think, is, a, is not a good way to arrive at truth.
We will now have a period of 20 minutes, conclusions, 10 minutes for Michael Shermer, 10 minutes for Kyle Butt. Mr. Shermer. All my life I've wanted to be tall like Kyle, and now I have, it turns out it's better <laughs> for the microphone that I'm not so tall. <laughs> All guys want to be taller for some reason. It has to do with girls, I think. Anyway, um, okay, so let me just make a few comments about um, things that Kyle said here. Um, uh, free will is a useful fiction. I mean that it, it's just there are certain concepts that we may never know. You know, there's known knowns, there's known unknowns, and then there's unknown unknowns. Um, and it, this may be one of those, just the concept itself, the word itself. You know, how, do, how can I know what it's like to be you? I can't. You know, but it's reasonable to assume that the expressions I see on your face that are similar to, to mine, you're probably feeling the same emotions that I feel are pretty close to. It's a reasonable assumption. And I think free will is one of those. It's just one of those, it's just one of those words. How could, how could you, you know, libertarian free will where there's a little mini me inside you that makes the decisions for you. That's just mini me making the decisions, not me. And then, that, and then who's making the decisions for mini me? That's to be a mini, mini me inside mini me inside me. And, and you get that infinite regress. So I, I think there's concepts like that. Consciousness is a word we use to describe what, what the brain does when it's acting. You know, it's a, it becomes a mind. The mind is a word we use to describe what the brain is doing. Uh, but I don't want to imbue it or reify it as a thing that's floating around up there. There's no mind floating around up there. There's just neuron swapping chemicals. What we call consciousness or mind is a concept. What it means exactly, it's hard to say. And scientists disagree on this. The so-called hard problem has not been solved. And I think probably never will be because of the problem with our, our concepts again. And I think that's what happens when you kind of turn to this dualistic idea of there's something else. Uh, there's soul and body, there's mind and brain, there's corporeal and incorporeal, there's the natural, the supernatural. The problem is how do you get at it? How do we know uh, it's true? What should I believe? Back to knowledge defined as justified true belief. What's the justification for believing that that's real? And uh, my favorite cartoon on this, Sidney Harris cartoon of the two mathematicians at the blackboard with the equations. And then in the middle, one of them writes, and then a miracle happens. And the other mathematician says, I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> what, what do you mean? And then a miracle happens. Uh, and, and that's, and, you know, the, the spoof there is that, you know, using those words, like, and, and, then, and then this a paranormal event happened, and then a, a, the supernatural happened. These are just words we're using. There's no such thing as the supernatural or the paranormal. There's just the natural and the normal and stuff we can't explain. I mentioned witches. People centuries ago in Christian Europe absolutely believed in witches. They, you know, the toothless lady down the, the street there, she's the cause of the, the plague or, 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 or the cow that died or the, the storm. And, you know, and everybody believed that. And nobody believes that today, at least in the Western world. Uh, what happened? Well, we replaced it with justified true belief, scientific knowledge. We now have an understanding of how plagues happen in the weather and events and chance, randomness and so on, and, it, and witches don't exist. And you know that they don't. Women cannot cavort with uh, demons on their brooms at night. It just doesn't happen. But everybody believed that it did at one point. What happened? Science. That's what happened. Rationality. But the moment you say, well, but I still think there's something supernatural. Okay, maybe, but how would you know? Because I'm a natural being. How do I get out to that? How do, I, how do you measure it? What would it look like? How do we know? Back to Sagan's dragon. You know, and it's not enough to say, I feel the presence, or this incredible thing happened to my life, and, and I met my spouse, or I got this job, and you know, God made all this happen. Yeah, maybe, but maybe that's just how it goes. <laughs> it's just randomness. You'd have met, if you hadn't met that person, you'd have met somebody else and be equally happy with that person. And you say, oh, well, God arranged our... Real no, this is just, how, it's just randomness. This is how the world works. Five minutes. So my commitment to naturalism isn't like some dogmatic, closed-minded, I'm not going to embrace supernaturalism. Well, I, I will if you could show me how to measure it. But by definition, you can't, because you can't measure it. It's supernatural. 
And the moment you say, yeah, but occasionally God reaches into the natural world to stir the particles to make something happen. All right? How does God do that? How does a non-corporeal being interact with a physical substance? Inquiring minds want to know, and there's no answer to that. <laughs> you know, and it, it's like in science, we, we use words too, like, you know, dark energy and dark matter. These are invoked to explain why galaxies rotate the way they do. They don't have enough mass to rotate at that speed. There's something else in there we can't measure yet. And the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate faster than it should from what we know. Therefore, there must be this thing called dark energy. But cosmologists don't, that's not an explanation. They don't mean it as an explanation. Those are just linguistic placeholders until we figure out what it is that's going on. And the problem with the supernatural religious stepping into the empirical truth world is how are you going to do that? You're just using words, but you're stopping the causal explanation at the word. It's the supernatural thing that happened. That's not an explanation. That's just a word. What's the next step? How does God do that? It would be interesting to know. Many Christians believe God cures cancer. Okay, but why is it always things that might have gotten better anyway? Why does, uh, I hate to use this cliche example, but why doesn't God heal amputees? Not one amputee has ever grown a new limb. Not one, even these Christian soldiers with Christian families that pray for them, it never happens. Why not? The answer seems obvious, because there's no God, or if there is, he's not, he's not curing anybody of anything. It's just randomness, is what, how you explain it. Okay, as for the, the universe is not finely tuned for us. That's a very anthropocentric. Most of the universe is quite inhospitable to life. There's very, very few places you could live. We're finely tuned for the world, not vice versa. This idea that design, well, so I got, I got this watch here, you know, so there must be a watchmaker. There's a world, there must be a world maker. But I can go to the Tag Heure uh, company and see where they make it. I can see the designers designing it and making it. Where do I go to see the des intelligent designer, the supernatural intelligent designer? You can't show it to me. There's no place to go. So it's a false analogy. You can see the designer, okay, there's design things. What we have instead is a scientific explanation for design. That is, the eye is designed to see, but it's a functional design from the bottom up through natural selection. Wings are designed to fly, but they're not great, they're pretty good, and there's lots of different kinds of wings. Some wings are good for flight, others are good for thermoregulation, others have different functions, like crawling up steep hills and so on. And, you know, that's how nature works. It's kind of cobbled together from what already exists before in some adaptive function. So I just want to make that point, uh, and finally, uh, about the kind of the fine-tunedness of the physical constants. You hear these uh, numbers thrown about. There's a lot we still don't know in physics. There's no unified theory between the quantum level, quantum physics, and Einsteinian general Globe, uh, relativity. That is, the macro big world of gravity, the micro world of quantum effects. No one has been able to unify those yet. Lots and lots of people are trying. So this idea that, well, we have these spooky numbers, and if it was, the no, no numbers were tuned slightly differently, we wouldn't be here. This is just an argument from ignorance. We just don't know yet. There's so much we don't know about the physical and biological world. And we're working on it. And that's the, the joy of science, is you get to try to figure it out. And someday we, we may know. And it doesn't help to say, well, that's, I'm going to just stop thinking and say, a miracle happened, and that's, that's my answer. It's just not an answer. Anyway, finally, if you want to believe, go ahead. It's like the free will thing. Yes, there's determinists that think I'm wrong and so on. We debate. You know, but just do what you got to do. And if having a religious truth, like a mythical truth, uh, is useful and works for you, fine. But take it out of the realm of, I can prove it's true, because it puts it in the realm of, and if you don't believe it, you're wrong. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here. It's been, I think, a great exchange putting forward 
the idea that God does exist. I think we founded that on evidence. I think that we have really gotten to look deeply into some very serious topics. I want to thank Dr. Shermer for being here and every one of you. It means a lot that this many people care to think of and to look at these discussions. I want to start out by, by nailing down what I tried to do and seeing what happened in the debate. I tried to put forth four absolute foundational truths that we can know that point to the existence of a God. Number one, that physical materialistic effects have to have a cause. And I think we saw several people from the scientific community say that at the beginning that would break down, which means there has to be something that's not physical that would cause the universe. Now, that is not a play with words. What's going on there is we've used the law of cause and effect in every single experiment that's ever been done in the history of humanity, and we see how physical matter works. What got the universe here cannot be physical matter. And so we're not playing with words. We're not saying, okay, well, if it was supernatural, then it would just mean it's natural, but it's different. No, it's something totally different than the materialistic universe. That's what we're saying. Uh, number two, complex functional information has to have an intelligent designer. In every single instance where we know the origin of complex functional information, we know that intelligence was the cause of that. This is not a cobbled up discussion from the ground up evolution. Evolution is not true. And the idea that somehow these things have been cobbled, the human brain, which is only as smaller than a basketball, but is better at computing stuff than a supercomputer, is not something you cobble together. It's so perfectly put together and so uh, precisely put together that it has functional complexity to almost the, almost the nth degree, and we know when we see that there has to be an intelligent designer. Now here's what's inter interesting to me. Gives you the watch and says, hey, what about this watch? Uh, I can go down to the watch company and find out the people that have made it. Did he go down to the watch company and see them? I, I doubt it. What does that mean? It means that you can look at the thing itself without ever going to the company and knowing something about what the company does. You can know as you look at that watch that the company has machines that can make tiny levers, that the company is, is working by intelligent structure, etc. You don't have to go to the company to know that. And I dare say most of us who have watches haven't been to the company to see it. So what are we saying? You could have an, an artifact. You could have a singular artifact that you could look at and regardless of where it came from, you could know if there was intelligence behind its construction. And I think that's what we do. In our world, we have artifacts such as the human brain, et cetera, and, and it, there are all kinds of them. We've got all kinds of, of examples on our website that nail that down, and I think you see the, the validity of that. Now, I'd like to just touch on some things that he said. One of the main points was, well, you just can't know things. And okay, there is objective truth, but you can't know that objective truth. And then he gave us this example of, okay, objectively we can know how many, there, there are a certain number of people in this auditorium today. Uh, 967. He said, I don't know what the actual number is. He said, but your knowledge of that can't be true. Well, that's just not true. Can we, if we had the right equipment, look at how many people were in here define what in here means and count them and know how many people are in here. Yes, absolutely positively we can do that. And so the idea that somehow there's objective knowledge out there, but you can't have it. Well, I just don't think that bears up. And I understand what he's trying to say, and that is we can't know everything. Well, sure, nobody's saying we know everything, but there are some things we can know. And I believe I'm nailing down these four foundational truths that you can know I believe we are. I believe, believe they've been out there. I'm not nailing them down. Let me take that back. I, I, I'm not nailing anything down. They've been out there for, for the beginning of creation. And they are logically pointing overwhelmingly to the conclusion that the God of the Bible exists. Five minutes. Now, uh, I, I want to take this idea, and I, I really think we need to uh, spend a little time on it. Uh, we talked about children are born into this world with the 
predisposition to believe that there is a God. In fact, Sam Harris said, if you took small children and you put them on an island and never taught them a single thing, they would arrive at the conclusion that God exists. They, small children, come into the world with an understanding, and this is in Dr. Shermer's writings, of the law of cause and effect. They recognize cause and effect. They come into the world with an innate understanding of morality. Now let's put these pieces together. You know, Dr. Shermer says, well, we can't know a supernatural being because I'm a natural being and I could never breach that gap. Only if you assume and make a commitment to naturalism. If you have a soul and God created that soul and put it in your body at the point of conception, then you have a great explanation for why people come into this world with an innate understanding, with a brain that seems like it was designed to misunderstand naturalistic explanations for the origin of the universe. Why would it seem that way? Because it was designed to misunderstand naturalistic origins of the universe because they don't correspond to what you can know to be fact. And so as you look at this idea, if you start with saying, well, I, I'm a supernatural, I mean, I'm just a natural being, so I can't know the supernatural. Only if there's a commitment, a prior commitment to naturalism. And I think that is where the unbelief in atheistic proposition simply fails. That what comes out of the atheistic, atheistic atheistic and unbelief thinking is correct if you start with a commitment to naturalism. But if there's more than this, then the commitment to naturalism shows that it doesn't correspond with what we know to be true. And I think that's what we're dealing with here. Um, the aspect of the Enlightenment and somehow Christians have come to the conclusion now that anti-Semitism is wrong and that uh, women's rights are what needs... Okay, that is not how Christianity arrives at its conclusions. Now, is it true that there have been people who call themselves Christians that did things that went against the nature of Christ? Oh, absolutely, positively. Have people who called themselves Christians behaved in very racist ways? Have people who called themselves Christians gone to the holy lands, as they are called, and killed other people to try to take back a piece of property? Yes, that's happened. That's never anything that Jesus Christ would have stood for and never anything that Jesus Christ was behind. When you look at why Christians aren't anti-Semitic, what you find is when God says in Genesis chapter 1 that He created humans in His image, male and female He created them, what He is nailing down from the beginning of the creation account in Genesis is that every human being is valuable for a singular reason, and that's because they're humans. Two minutes. And that the idea that somehow racism can be based in Christianity, that's just simply, simply false. And you listen to Peter's statement of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, those who fear God and work righteousness are accepted by God. Now, let's finish with this idea. Um, Madeline Murray O'Hare started the American Atheist Organization, and she bitterly fought against God for her whole life. After she passed away, when her documents and diaries and things of that nature were found, Six different places, there was a statement where she said, Somebody, somewhere, please love me. You know, this has been a discussion of lots of empirical evidence, but I think what all of us know is that deep down, every one of us one minute. yearns for somebody, somewhere, to love us. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He left the glories of heaven. He came to walk on this planet as a poor person in Palestine in the first century, and He gave His life on a cross for us because He loves us. I would encourage everyone to gravitate to the love of Jesus and look with truth and reason at the evidence. And when you do, I believe you will become a New Testament Christian.
I think it would be highly appropriate for us to please give a round of applause to both the participants. Yes, please. We thank both these gentlemen for being willing to come to Montgomery, Alabama, to Faulkner University. Thank you, President Henry, for making this happen. Let's give President Henry a round of applause. This was his idea. And I said, yes. And so we had it. And so we're glad that you came, all of you coming from long distance. Thank you, thank you. Have a safe journey back. For those of you watching online, thank you for taking the time to join us. And may God richly bless you all. You're dismissed.